All right, welcome back, everybody. Everyone well fed and maybe a little sleepy now? <laughs> All right, so I'm looking forward to our last two hours here together to really discuss what we've been thinking about over the past day and a half. Um, our plan until 2.30 will be we'll hear from uh, the breakout group folks. One person from each group will share back how the discussions went and what they talked about. And then after they each do that, um, I'll invite up our panel of expert provocateurs, perhaps, um, to uh, provide some insights and reactions to what they heard. And then we will evolve that into a group discussion about not just the breakout groups, but our whole day and a half together and this whole topic and where we might go um, as a group. So I look forward to that. So um, I'll invite up, I think that the butterfly group is going first, I believe. Is that right? No, not butterfly. Chestnut. Chestnut's going first. Todd is going first. Um, so come on up. And Todd, take up to 10 minutes and use this mic. And then we'll have time for just a couple minutes of clarifying questions after each person goes. Todd from the Chestnut Group. All right, so thank you. Um, I apologize because I have to run out right after this to get to another meeting. Um, but just to give you kind of a quick overview of what we were discussing. So we were discussing the reintroduction of the American chestnut tree, um, which was basically uh, decimated from a blight that was caused by, in essence, um, someone bringing over that blight from China along with the Chinese chestnut tree. Um, the int one of the interesting things about this case study is that there are simultaneously two competing sciences um, developing the, chest the American chestnut tree to be introduced. So one of them is using a sort of traditional crossbreeding method with the Chinese chestnut tree, which has a resistance to that blight. Uh, the second, which is probably maybe the more controversial uh, component, is there's a group out of, um, I'm blank, kind of a school in New York State um, that is basically um, taking a gene from, from wheat, which has this resistance to the blight, and inserting that into the American chestnut tree. So the idea being, that you will reintroduce these American chestnut trees into uh, the wild. Um, I'd like to start off and say that um, we had a really um, lively discussion, and I think part of that, or the, mostly because we actually had multiple stakeholders um, around that table. So we had um, actual members of the of, of journalists there that were actually part of the actual framing of this specific issue. Uh, we had a couple of NGOs in the room, I myself and an environmental scientist. Uh, we also had um, genetic specialists that are working that we can maybe call the, the, gen the scientists per se. Um, I would also say that we probably didn't answer really any of these questions. <laughs> um, but um, that being said, um, one of the things that we discussed was that, was how you actually frame this issue. Um, and what came out from, I think, the multiple stakeholders in this room that there are many different frames around just this particular issue. Um, so there were frames about the ecological implications frame about reintroducing a species. Um, there was a food frame that came some, from some of the background readings that doing this would be a positive thing because you could sort of create a new sort of food supply. Um, there's obviously the sort of GMO frame to this issue. Um, there's also sort of a conservation frame. So we had um, members of the group that were sort of looking at this in essence as, as tree lovers and that would like to see this, this particular species sort of being able to go out into the forest. And so the frame around valuing the fact that you could have this tree back out there that you could sort of see in the forest. Um, and then there's also the frame of should we be doing this frame? And these were all sort of frames, um, many of them which we didn't think was in the current debate that's out there now. Um, and so um, with that, um, we sort of were sort of, I guess we answered one of these questions in saying that we maybe believe that the scientists have actually successfully framed this issue in terms of what they're looking for. So the frame sort of, it seems that anyway in our discussions that we're probably already going to do this and now the question is maybe how? And so what we really were focusing on is how do you bring in those other frames into this larger discussion about um, reintroducing uh, the American chestnut, whether it's using the GMO variety or using sort of the more traditional uh, crossbreeding variety. Um, another sort of topic that came up as we were discussing these different frames was 
um, and I think this came out a lot yesterday too, is it's not really clear how much society even cares about this particular issue or how engaged they are. Um, so we're not really sure if people even, one, know that, say, there aren't any American chestnuts available, right? And that was actually another frame that's sort of being used is that these chestnuts are extinct. So there's a de-extinction frame when, in fact, the reality is there's actually American chestnuts still growing. They just only get to a certain height, and then they come susceptible to this blight and die. So that's a frame that's out there that is probably maybe incorrect that's part of this larger discussion. Um, but really that question is how much, in how much engagement there actually is in society around this particular issue is still an open question and how you then address these seven questions about whether the way that they sort of were doing public engagement, the way they frame these things is kind of hard to answer if we're not even sure the public even cares about this particular issue. Uh, let me just see. Um, oh, another thing that's, that actually sort of came up toward, towards the end was, and I think I forgot to mention this frame, was the regulatory frame about how these things get approved and whether the regulatory structure is capable of incorporating all of those various different frames I mentioned in their decision-making process to create a trust factor for when these types of technologies um, are approved, not approved, and then potentially uh, introduced. Uh, so with that, I'm sure I left things out. So if other people's in the group, there's something I glaringly missed um, or misrepresented, uh, please let me know. Anyone else from um, Todd's group want to add anything? Anyone have questions for Todd or members in their group about their discussions or want to better understand something? Yeah, if you have a question, if you could go to the microphone. I want to remind you all this is being web broadcast still. We are live. There's some microphones behind you if you could go there. Thanks. Uh, Doya Ahmed, physicist. Uh, I think the public is, is very interested in this issue. I get uh, petitions every day about labeling uh, GMOs. And yeah, we, I was talking specifically about the American chestnut reintroduction. Oh, okay. So this was, we were focusing specifically on this case study. Uh -huh. um, and it, it's not clear, it wasn't clear to our group of, of really how much engagement there actually is because it's, it's unclear of how much people even know that this is going on <coughs> and that they're even thinking about doing it. Thank you. I understand the, the issue or the question of access to the scientific literature about science communication came up in your session and whether it was accessible or not. Was, did that come up? Um, not particularly. I mean, one thing we did say was that um, in terms of, of how well the scientists were doing is that they're actually very open about what it exactly is they're doing. Um, and even the competing sort of science groups um, are actually supportive of one another. So this particular example, um, it doesn't seem to be that there's any lack of, of transparency in terms of the science that they're using or putting it out there. I, I may have mischaracterized my question. The science of science communications literature as being useful to grounding scientists in how they communicate seems to be an issue in, from what other conversations I've heard about your session, seemed to be an issue in your session. Was that in fact the case? Yeah, I don't, yeah, that didn't come up in our I think it, well, all I'm reporting is what I heard at lunch. It came up in a negative frame that we didn't know that there was any literature out there to avail ourselves of. That's what I heard. I mean, someone else, I mean, maybe who you talk to can talk to that. <laughs> Other questions? All right, I have, I have a question. I'll, I'll use moderator privilege. <laughs> um, in terms of what you said about the public is not necessarily aware of this, what, what is, how can you characterize the group of people who, my understanding of this issue is there's a very passionate but small group who does care about it. Is that relevant in your discussions at all? Yeah, I mean, is I think it was. So one of the groups that, that is clearly sort of interested is actually the Native American community. Um, and I think this gets to what we were saying yesterday is that with most of these issues, there's, I would, I would argue, this is me speaking, not necessarily for our group that there are always going to be sort of um, engaged small communities that are interested in a particular issue. 
um, that tend to sort of lead the discussions um, and lead the decision-making process. Um, so that is true along with this. So in terms of whether it's the American Chestnut Foundation that's sort of obviously pushing this to reintroduce them or the Native American communities that have concerns about the naturalness of, of, of introducing sort of a species that has cultural significance to them um, are part of the discussion. But what I was talking about was sort of a broader, you know, societal sort of understanding of whether this is important, whether they're doing it, and whether they would support it or not. Thanks. All right. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we've got one more question. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, I just thought I would add that, you know, when we, we, I think it's probably true the public is not as aware about this opportunity, uh, but this is, isn't this what we're here about? It's, we have an opportunity to frame this one moving forward that sometimes you don't have. So this is, this is more of an opportunity than a, than a problem. Yeah. And did your group have any conversation about now, given where we are now, what might we do, science communication I think, I think we struggled with that because it's hard to judge whether, you know, these questions were sort of, in my opinion, I think maybe the larger group was sort of based on like, was this successful in terms of an engagement around mm -hmm. the topic? And it was hard to judge that because we didn't feel that there was actually a lot of engagement going on beside, yeah. outside of sort of the groups that were concerned. And so how you judge whether the whether the scientists were doing a good job or not is, is, is difficult. Great. Other questions? All right, thank you.